Hello for CNN. Hi, Dr. Malcolm Parlett. Um, you are the first speaker of the ODN Europe People in Gestalt in Organizational Development, uh, aimed at uh, introducing our community of ODNE with Gestalt practice. Um, so, M Malcolm, you're our f first speaker. Uh, you, you've got a, quite a long CV. Uh, you've started your career as an experimental psychologist with a PhD uh, from King's College, Cambridge. You're one of the first who ha has set up uh, a Gestalt training in the UK. You brought uh, one strand of Gestalt in the UK. You co founded the Gestalt Psychotherapy and Training Institute in the UK together with Patricia Clarkson. You served as a founding father of the Br British Gestalt Journal, a reference in, in, in the Gestalt world. Mm. You initiated the first conference, a Gestalt conference, together with Richard Tillett. Uh, you've been teaching on Gestalt and organization programs. And of course, more recently, uh, in 2015, you published Future Sense, Whole Intelligence, um, where you speak, uh, you've put together all your knowledge and experience in Gestalt into uh, uh, your book. And the second book you've published uh, together with Pike Francis on contact and context, new development in Gestalt uh, coaching. Uh, we're really, really pleased and honored to have you as our first guest at this ODNE series of videos. Um, do you want to add something for the introduction, Malcolm? Well, there's one small correction, which is that it wasn't the first Gestalt conference. It was the first Gestalt conference in Britain. Okay. So there had been Gestalt conferences before. Uh, there'd been a, a succession of them in the US. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, a, a small correction. Um, yeah, I mean, lots of lots of different ways in which uh, I was very fortunate to, as I became qualified and began to gain experience, the, the world opened up to the possibility of doing a lot more. And I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm pleased and proud of my contribution. Lots of other people, of course, were also making significant contributions, uh, particularly mentioned Gay Houston, for instance, who's been a complete stalwart and uh, but um uh yeah so mm. uh, th thank you well you were my first point of contact with gestalt and uh the first author in gestalt i ever read and the reflections on field theory uh, that you wrote in 1991 gave a real a rich theoretical background to gestalt practitioners in the topic of field theory you are one of the most respected voices on the topic of field theory in the Gestalt world. Tell you, can you tell us a bit more on the use of the Gestalt approach on field theory in, in the organizational development world? Well, of course, it's absolutely essential to all work in organizations. And not just in organizations, but communities, families, and in the dyad, the coach coachy relationship, so it's an it's a, an approach that uh, it's a way of thinking that is trying to handle the, the totality of experience, which we all know is made up of of hundreds of different things enter into the experience of of the actual experience that we have of, let's stay in, I'll stay with organizations since it's what you've asked. It's like in an organization, there are thousands of things going on. Where do you focus? And you have to kind of group things and try and see the interrelationship between the different elements. And that, and field theory is really encouraging that kind of holistic overview of trying to show the organization of uh, the organizational members experiences because there is a kind of collective sense of what the organization is it will differ enormously in its details 
from person to person and from mm. bit of the organization to bit of the organization. But nevertheless, there is something about the totality. And this is, so I think any, all OD practitioners are basically going to either, they know about field theory or they're going to be thinking in similar terms. So mm. that in fact, some people, I mean, I, I remember when I began talking about field theory, there was a very big debate going on in Gestalt. And I remember being challenged by Ed Nevis, whose point of view was that he used systems theory. Mm. And there were big discussions about explain the difference between field theory and systems theory. Well, of course, so I made something up, you know, or, or, or tried to do my best on that. But it's, there are all these different maps of, of ways of trying to engage with a complex, interactive, changing totality. So I think mm. that even if people have never heard of field theory, but they're deeply involved in the experience of being in organizations, they're going to be kind of inventing field theory ideas. Mm. Um, uh when you speak of field theory, of course, uh, Kurt Lewin is one of the, the first yes. to speak about it. Uh, is there a, a small, is there any change, any uh, difference between Kurt Lewin's model and what Gestalt people would use, uh, would refer to as field theory? Well, he was, the, he was, he, he set out the map, if you like, and uh, and he was himself an organisational researcher, and a, you know he was employed in part to study things like um, uh, f the food policy and so on in the Second World War. I mean, he and he and he set the parameters for um, OD work in many ways. He was a real he was a founder of social psychology. Of, of uh, tea groups, all, all sorts of things, and action research. So, I mean, he was absolutely pivotal figure. Mm. So, um, and not everybody in the Gestalt world, I think, uh, honours Kurt Lewin or mm. Levine. Um, some do and some don't. I mean, Georges Rollins, for instance, thought that there was too much emphasis on on Lewin's thing, but he he talked less about field and he he talked about the situation. And then so then there's a new discussion about uh, do we need both terms? My feeling is uh, actually that they both have uses. Mm. Just as I actually think that having multiple maps is a very good idea. So that I I don't have I I didn't want to get hung up on the discussion about differences between system theory and field theory. They're attempts, they're all attempts at describing what is actually indescribable in neat conceptual language. It's mm. something ultimately that we have to experience, this uh, enveloping totality that we go into and we, we know, we know it at an embodied level. Uh, and we know that when you go into one organization, there's a different kind of quality and atmosphere and go into another one and it's completely different. And those things are incredibly subtle and important differences very often. So that, and somebody so that somebody going from one to the other may say something like, oh, I was in, it was great where I used to be here. I feel so constrained and I, you know, the different norms, different um, values, different priorities. But and equally, somebody may say, God, I just moved into this new department or this new position or new organization. And wow, I feel so energized and, and ready for everything. Mm. So it's like, um, uh, I mean, this is, this is, I'm back to the sort of five principles that I put in that 1991 paper. You know, the, the, singular, the singularity of each field 
you know, we're talking about unique organizations, not standardized or routinized patterns. It's not a formal, we don't go into an organization and draw out the, the um, official lines of communication. That kind of thinking. It's completely different from that. So I think that Gestaltists are very well equipped. I mean, in fact, when um, Marianne Chidiak and Sally Dillon Vaughan, you know, talk about ROG, I think <laughs> it is a field relational organizational mm -hmm. because it is, it's such a central tenet. And I'm gonna pick up where the two of you stopped for a moment. And I'm going to invite you, Malcolm, if you can reflect on something which is kind of a, m the most dearest topic that you have been writing uh, for and reflecting on. That's the book uh, Future Sense or the concept of whole intelligence that uh, you were writing and brought up to the public in 2015. Uh, a book that seems to be even more relevant today than it was five years ago, at least for me, because I find myself using it on a daily basis and rereading all of the declarations which are in it uh, to support myself and my work. So could you tell us a bit more about the motive behind writing this book, what inspired you, and maybe how it relates to what you and Angelica just spoke about, uh, field theory? Yes, it, it's, it was, um, I started really in the, a paper of 2000, which was also my, um, inaugural lecture at the University of Derby when I was appointed a visiting professor there. Uh, and that included um, the description of the five abilities, as I was calling them at that point. Mm. And that had been brewing for two or three years before that. So we're going back to sort of 1997, probably, when I first had the... Um, ideas and that it grew out of or uh, yes it grew out really of of being so aware that that people went through when they were having a gestalt education which i like to call it an education rather than a training um they they learn things they they change as a result of that whether they're clients or trainees or practitioners but they keep learning along certain dimensions and I think that that what I was trying to do right at the beginning was to conceptualize to put into words what some of these fundamental sort of learning trajectories were that people were going through mm -hmm. and um, so that and the work and I did actually write a, a complete book in 2003 which I wasn't um, confident about publishing or trying to get out in the world and we're going I'm with uh, Anne Pettit a present colleague of mine we're going to revisit that and possibly um, add to it and come to publication about it but anyway, so I've been working on this and, I, and then between 2003 and 2015, lots of other things were going on in my life. Um, and including the fact that I had a relationship, very important relationship uh, with a Norwegian Gestaltist who was also an OD practitioner, as well as a therapist. And she and I, she was going to help me work on this. And then unfortunately she got cancer and eventually died. And I promised that I would complete the book and publish it. And I think that I was so resistant uh, to somehow putting out something which was a, a fairly radical restatement of what I knew. It wasn't sort of paka gestalt. You know, that was the feeling I had about it. So I've, so there was a lot that went into it. Most of all, my strong feeling that then and even more now, of course, 
that we're in a world crisis. Mm. But it was obvious way back that we were heading for a massive crisis and it's upon us. And particularly environmentally and, and sustainability wise. And somehow Gestalt needed to embrace this reality. And it seemed to me that what was needed was that some of these basic skills which I'd observed in the course of people undergoing a Gestalt education needed to be more available to a greater number of people and to every level of system as a kind of currency of, 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 um, of, of practical practicability and usefulness, you know, something that could be grasped, didn't engage, didn't uh, use the rather more esoteric language of Gestalt, mm -hmm. as, as it, a lot of the refined theory of, which I love, of course, and I appreciate it, but that's not to go out and try and sell the subtle meanings of the contact boundary to a group of board managers or whatever, is not going to doesn't work you know it takes years to understand a concept like the contact boundary or lots and lots of our concepts mm. that's so i wanted to do something to that used more available language that really assisted people to confront the existential realities of living today and empowered them possibly. And I think in a way I was inventing a language, a sort of conceptual language and a practical language uh, that was, um, that people could pick up and grasp. And in the course of writing that book, Future Sense, what came clear was that I wasn't just talking about five different dimensions, I, what were the dimensions of? And then uh, the term whole intelligence emerged. Mm. And that <clears throat> has been a very useful term because, and I think you've also used it in some of your work, and what's amazing about it is that people understand it at some deep level, it resonates. Mm. And that somehow the notions of intelligence that confine it to intellectual performance or to IQ tests or even IQ plus EQ or any mm. other subset. It's like you've got to look at the whole, it's holism again. Mm. And, and um, it's like we're looking in, and I looked in the book, at the, at the whole nature of what it meant to be a competent actor in the world, a, 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 a person who could make a contribution and also take care for themselves and enact their values. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it was a, it is a deeply personal and uh, ambitious book. Um, and I'm, and I, I, um, uh, the, the original print runners sold out basically. I've got a few copies left, but um, it's selling slowly on the uh, as an ebook, and I'm shortly, hopefully, going to turn it into an audio book. So I'm hoping it will get out more, and I'm open to the possibility of it being republished, um, maybe as a second edition with with changes or with a new introduction. Mm. Or something. Mm. But it is it is. It is the most important of my publications. Um, and I say that, I'd actually, I would have to qualify that because I think that some of my theory, field theory papers are also what I'm proud of. Hmm. I can definitely relate to what Fratina said. Uh, your book is a comeback to me. Um, and uh, Christina and I both use uh, whole intelligence in our OD world. We find it as a framework which is um, which makes sense 
not only to uh, clients in the corporate world, but also to ourselves. Hmm. Um, and our use of selfless instrument, uh, which yeah. is it, a pivotal term uh, nowadays uh, in the OD world. Uh, but somehow you said in the first when answering the first question uh, when working with field theory we need to be in the situation and be off the situation and yes. use ourselves yes. as instruments um, so we do use it to uh, use the five explorations to check on ourselves to check on the teams check on the surroundings uh, to see what what's missing what needs to be worked on what what's your take on on the, the the five explorations and use of self as instruments? Can you tell us something more about it? Mm, yeah. Well, uh, the five explorations are. What are they doing? They're exploring the whole, the whole of the field, and and uh, they represent different ways into that, like there are five gateways into the, the whole. And, um, uh, and I am writing a paper about this. I've been trying to write it for some while, but I keep on getting distracted. But the, the essence of it is that um, the, if, you think, if you start thinking about the self as instrument, it's, a, we're, we're, it's an instrument with five different <laughs> ways of being involved mm. so the most obvious one um, in a sense is the way in which we are ourselves registering the qualities and subtleties of the field that we are in and we register it in our to total response to that in other words it's in our bodies we feel that we feel it we see things we hear things we're putting together uh, and we we need to a, a picture of what's uh, the conditions that we're in the the context that we're in and so that that's the first way in which if you like we are using ourselves as an instrument mm. that we're sensing devices we're like geiger counters we go into a situation and we think, oh my God, this is there's heavy duty stuff here. And we know it at a, at a, it's not a cognitive process. I mean, there's cognition involved, but it's not primarily um, uh, something we're thinking about, at least initially. It's something we're impacted by directly. We feel it mm -hmm. in our whole being. And that's and we take that seriously, and that's one that's one of the five explorations to be embodied, and it's so that's one way. But then let's go down the others. I mean, it's like in responding to the situation, which is another one, uh, drawing attention to in a way to the fact that we are uh, as practitioners, as OD practitioners say or coaches or whatever role we're in we are dealing with a reality which is seen seen experienced understood in different ways by different people and that um people respond to not nominally what is will for the moment pretend is the same situation i'll come on to that in a moment but um people's responses are very different so that some people like uh, come and they're ready to take on a challenge and to fight the down the obstacles and cross the barriers and whatever and others meet the quotes same situation mm. um, again I'll come back to that um, but they're fearful or that they are holding themselves back so that the, the individual patterns change and departments in organizations can do this. So one department may be all for um, bringing in new ideas and uh, challenging authority and whatever. And then another department in the same organization 
may be completely different and very authoritarian and subservient and confluent and so on. So, I mean, there are these enormous patterns of responding. And then, of course, what's really interesting about this one is that there, what is the live situation that they're dealing with is going to be different. So that in a sense, you know, it's the difference between context or environment and field. The context of the environment is a sort of abstraction, really, because when we get into how a field, how an, a, a context or an environment is perceived, we're into the phenomenal reality of the, the, the field as, a, as experience. And the, so the, the situation, and I'm using field and situation more or less synonymously at this point, is that, is that um, so when I'm interviewing, say, in, a, in an organization, the, and I, how the chief executive regards and responds to the company, say, and how somebody in a middle management position in the same company will see it differently, completely differently, and those differences are crucial. So, so here, I'm an instrument, but I'm an instrument who is an in inquirer, a detective, somebody who is exploring and, and teasing out the different perceptions that exist and which are, which are present in the organization. And there can be many, many, many of these. And then you start seeing the patterns that, it, you know, that there's some that are more frequent than, than others and so on. So that's the second one. Interrelating, which is the third exploration, and they don't come in any fixed order, by the way. But the interrelating is that I'm, as an, somebody coming in, as the OD practitioner coming in, I am part of the field and I am absolutely critical in what happens as a result of my being there. So here I am an instrument of change, of being sensitized to what's happening there. I'm a, I'm a, an, a, a supporter of a, an inquiry process or a change process. And it's based on how my presence, my, my um, capacity to dialogue, to get through, to, to listen, to understand, to respond to people's particular points of view, but also to, to dance with them. I mean, uh, we have a lot of use of the dance as a kind of mm. underlining the, the incredible potentialities that are based in dialogue and in, in, in the dance. You can dance so many different ways. And there's not one fixed way, but one way that, we have to recognize is that we are crucial uh, elements in the field. We're not mm. neutral or observers or whatever. We can't be that in the field theory album. So that's the third one. Then the other two, um, one is experimenting. Um, we are just building on that last notion um, of of being, uh, in a sense, party to being change agents without coming in with a deliberate plan to bring about a change, but being, in a sense, supportive of whatever changes or developments or evolution is happening. That's part of what we need to be supportive of. And any change involves experimenting. It means embracing novelty going beyond what is familiar and into the unknown. And our sensitivity, uh, the way that we're instruments, uh, again, is discerning when there needs to be more novelty, what freshness, vitality, new energy, and where, and if there's, uh, or, and sometimes where we need more familiarity and less novelty, if people are completely 
overwhelmed with change. We've seen a lot of this in, mm. in organizations, but there are changes brought in, and then another change, and then a change, and then a change of CEO, and a change of this, and a change of that. And people, what they need is the experiment of being not <laughs> going with the new, but staying with what they know is sure and familiar and which goes deeply into their roots mm. and to the foundations and come back to the solidity of that. So that's, that's where the, being an instrument, you have to be a fine tuned discerner of the what's necessary in this field to move it in the direction that in a sense needs to happen, that's waiting to be drawn out. And then the last one, self-recognizing, is, um, uh, well, this is absolutely that we need to be reflexive. And all, and that's, so this is being, this is looking into, if we're um, instruments, what is, what is the instrument that we are and how are we doing with this? Mm. And, and I think that it, there's a particular thing that I've really quite recently been underlining more, is that every intervention that we as practitioners make comes from our past. Mm. It, ultimately, it comes from our past, something that we've learned something that we've experienced in the past, something that we are connecting what is in immediate in our reality to something that is something we've read or something that we remember somebody t talking about or whatever. So that there is, in a way, part of the self-recognizing that we need to do is to be mindful of that, that everything that we do is something to do with us. So everything, in a sense, following mm. Fritz Pearls here, you know, everything ultimately is projection. Mm. We're, we're coming from who we are, what we've assimilated, what we've taken on, taken in and integrated and has become our experience. And our experience is vital. So it's not wrong to be projecting in this case, it's right. It's, we need to draw on our experience. And it, what, it, it's what makes, in a sense, um, that we're a learning instrument, if you like, and we're an instrument that, that is continuously processing and making sense of ourselves in relation to the group that we're working with. Mm. And we need to, in some sense, be very mindful of that. It's a, it's a practice, it's a discipline. And, and that, that's where uh, supervision, I guess, plays a vital role. Um, yeah. on how we can sharpen our uh, sense yeah. of self as an instrument. Yes, so, yes, and it, supervision and also self-supervision. Mm. And this is <clears throat> one of the ways in which I think that the five explorations is a useful uh, little chart, as it were, not a chart, what's the word I'm after? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a useful guide or way of checking um, so that coming out of a meeting or something uh, you may think mm, I didn't go so well that meeting I don't know so then run through the list a little checklist well were we responding to the situation mm -hmm. yeah yeah they wanted me to do this and we clearly needed to do that and we got on with it yeah so that my sort of dissatisfaction isn't to do with that. So is it to do with the interrelating? Mm. Well, I think we made a good connection overall. And mm. anyway, you go through the list, you see, and then you might find something that, um, well, what we didn't do at all, really, was to um, do anything terribly novel. We didn't really stretch ourselves into the unfamiliar. It was all a bit routine. It was all a bit samey. That might be it. In which case, mm. it gives you a line, you know, so then you can home in on what, what was missing, what, the, what experiments could we have done? What mm. new things could I have done here that introduce 
fresh energy and vitality. Mm. And, and you can see all of them. And I, it, let me just say that because um, the two extra points about this that I would always underline in teaching about this stuff. First of all, these all five are necessary. Mm. You can't, and for, for high performance that you can't, if you, if you're only firing, as it were, on three of them, forget it, in a sense, you need to, there's a lot of work to be done there. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all, they're all part of, in a sense, creating uh, high performance conditions and, and um, people really being uh, fully themselves and able to function at a high level. Um, so that's one point. They all go together. And <laughs> I've forgotten the other point. Um, what was I going to make? Oh, sorry, it's gone. But uh, it, it was an important point, <laughs> which I haven't, can't summon up at this second. Hmm. And sometimes they we'll have the opportunity to come back. Yeah. Sorry for saying that. No, no worries. Um, as you were talking, Malcolm, I was holding an image which is quite vivid for me whenever I uh, use the whole intelligence concept as something that supports me. It's an image of medieval city where you have five different gates uh, to reach the square. So basically, um, I do resonate that we need them all in order to be good at what we are doing and to be able to explore the situation. And I guess changing the lenses of how we see and how we perceive the square can give us really meaningful information and data of what needs to happen next or how we can support the process or how we can introduce a new experiment or stretch, uh, not just our, uh, yeah, stretch ourselves in different ways that we will present ourselves in the, in the moment. And going to that, um, I'm now mindful about how, what's written in the book and uh, how many anecdotes and examples you give of how you use these uh, five exploration into working in organizations. So I'm curious whether you can share one with uh, our audience as a um, reference and we'll keep the others to, to be curious about and to explore them in the book. Yes. Well, uh, I, I, um... What comes to mind is, is when I worked with a, a community, it was an intentional community in the sense that it, it had a philosophy and it had a founder who'd, who'd kind of laid out a series of ethical and principles that they were going to, this community was going to live by. And the founder left, he died and the, community went on for a few years had with one or two people who kind of were hiding under his his sort of umbrella of thought but were also shifting very slowly and not so slowly sometimes the the original template the original thinking that underlay this community so the community began to change and so on and it and then, and at a certain point, it was clear that, um, uh, well, so there, there were some young, younger people joining it. One or two of them were very bright and, and questioning, radical, and wanted a real good look at this organization. And they brought me in uh, to study the organization and to give them some guidance and or some feedback about what I discovered. Um, I would just say, this is in sort of parentheses, but it's quite important. It may be related to the, the point that I didn't say earlier. I'm not sure whether it's the same one, but I did want to say this, that I began my professional career. I mean, uh, first of all, as an experimental psychologist, for which I was absolutely not fitted. But after that, I had 10 years of working uh, in the field of higher education as an organizational consultant, where the organization, of course, was the delivery of teaching 
and the learning process was part of that. And this, so and in the course of that, I developed um, basically um, some methodologies, uh, which was, uh, which I called, the methodology was called illuminative evaluation. And I've, I had a quite, um, uh, in that field, I had a, a seminal paper, rather like the 1991 paper, but this was a 1972 paper, so it's going back a long way. But anyway, but part of that thinking of illuminative evaluation was that you, in the first stage of it, you just kind of saturate yourself. You soak in the, I would say now the field, you know, you, you or the context and you, you experience the totality and register it in the ways that we've been talking about and you're exploring whatever. But as the work goes on, in illuminative evaluation, you begin to focus. They called it progressive focusing in those days. It's like you, you're looking at, at the first at everything, and then slowly you realize that there's certain themes, certain directions of the work, uh, where there's more, you can describe them as more meaty, but if you're a, a vegan, that doesn't really work. But you know, it, there's something that's more salient or more, um, central to the organization of this system that you're looking at. The structure of it and the, or the key processes that one's observing in it. And the progressive focusing means that instead of, as it were, distributing one's attention right across everything, which you do at the beginning when you're kind of soaking up the medium, you know, you're being marinated in it, if you like. Here, you are beginning to be a more focused inquirer. And as the work goes on, you're working more and more towards the definitive, maybe definitive experiment or the def definitive report stage or the confrontation or whatever. So what I think in this, in this, uh, work with the community. What I realized was that there was major differences between um, some of the key players mm -hmm. and they were quite in a way personal and clashes of personality sort of level. And it wasn't being talked about. It was too dangerous to be talked about if you like in that organization at that time. So that the, and this became clearer and clearer, that this was absolutely key to understanding this organization, and how it was operating and where it was having problems. So that um, it, there came a time when I was giving feedback to the whole community and it was all assembled. And I found myself just saying, that I think there's some very serious differences between people here that you're not talking about. And I can't remember exactly what I said, but it was like, I named it. And that was my intervention. The critical intervention was to bring something out into the open mm -hmm. that had been fudged or avoided or deflected from. And uh, it changed everything. It, it, it led to, there was uh, one or two people were very put out by it, some of the key players, and others were just so delighted that it had been named. And, um, uh, and it was like a turning point, it was high contact. In the stark terms, it was a high contact moment, um, but it was necessary. And um, so that's an example of where, if you like, I was, um, I was doing, if I kind of go back and bring in the five explorations, it was like I was doing a lot of interrelating, meeting people, talking, listening, gathering data mm. uh, to how this, the situation was conceived and their different responses to it from different parties and persons 
and subgroups. Um, I was attending to the, the feelings of comfort and discomfort that were generated in me. And some, I had some period, aspects of discomfort in this because I knew that I was gonna have to basically screw my courage to the sticking place or whatever the Shakespearean term is, that I had to say something about this. I had to find a way of talking about this mm. uh, because nobody else was doing that. And I, in other situations, maybe I could have supported somebody to do it, but there wasn't anybody there who, who could have done it. Mm. So that's where I had to use my presence. That was my experimenting, my willing to, to take a risk to, act uh, so that was my response to the situation and i had to recognize the dangers to me and whether i'd be traduced chucked out you know denied my fee or whatever but and so there was all those all the elements came into it all the explorations came into it hmm. I but, um, I could give lots of examples, but it's, that was the one that came to mind. Mm. Oh, it, it, it is a great example. Christina, did you want to say something as well? Uh, yeah, I was about to say that, uh, thank you for, for sharing this uh, brief story and your experience, because for me, it's a great example of how um, the five explorations are being used and how self as instrument is actually being used in practice, because it's a really nice way of looking into the whole process and um, I would go back to the Gestalt, the Gestalt philosophy of how we work with the present and what is in the moment and sometimes we bring the elephant in the room that nobody talks about. Mm -hmm. And I agree, sometimes mm -hmm. it takes a lot of self-support and courage to, to name it and to voice it. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. and that's a way in fact that, um, <clears throat> I mean the notion of supporting oneself, being uh, one's own supervisor, Mm. Uh, because sometimes, you know, occasional supervision is great, and particularly if we're stuck and not getting anywhere and another set of eyes and thoughts and feelings and whatever can really shift us. So mm. I don't want to minimize the importance of supervision with others. But at the same time, we also need ongoing supervision <laughs> when we're actually out there doing the work. Mm. And that's where I think it can be useful. Um, and self-care is part of self-support and I, self care really belongs in uh, oh yes I know what I finally got to the point <laughs> that, that the the eat that actually um, there's another whole layer uh, of working with these five explorations which is to think about them two at a time mm. so when I'm teaching uh, sometimes I'll, I might start off by people talking about talking to each other, say in a pair, um, and they're looking at their relationship. They're looking at their contact and the dialogue and the listening and the creation of their little dance or whatever. Uh, but then the next exercise is to say, pay attention to this dimension relating as you've just been doing, but add in now paying attention to your embodied communication. Mm. How are you affecting each other at that sort of level? So bring that in. So it's like the two things together are very important. So that each of the pairings opens up a new, a new kind of inquiry, a new kind of using them as instruments to use mm. two at a time. And then of course you can, uh, if you're teaching, get people to do three at a time. So mm -hmm. like, okay, now concentrate on your relationship, concentrate on your embodied realities and bring in something really new here. Mm. Experiment. So then that's, and then, uh, so that when, what this develops is first of all, that they all begin to converge and interact and they depend upon each other and they support each other in emerging and being useful and connected. Um, and um, I lost my chain of thought again. Getting on mm -hmm. <laughs> is what happens when you get older. <laughs> um, 
that um, yeah that we yeah so it, yes oh yes I know what it was 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 um, in the terms of self care so that's to do with being embodied very often it's like what do I need physically here do I need to go outside and have a gulp of fresh air do I need to massage my brow do I need to stretch mm. do I need to have a sob <laughs> whatever you know mm. like mm. it's really attending to the self at an embodied level but it's also um, maybe it's also self-recognizing clearly it's like what mm. what what's happened here what how did I get to be so tired or mm. how is I feel overwhelmed here. Oh, that's it. Ah, oh, right. Mm. So, yeah. Definitely uh, a, a great example you gave us. And it brings me uh, of how Gestalt, the use of whole intelligence in organizations is different uh, than more traditional forms of OD. It's this attention to the body and to how people feel in the moment and not serving people what we think they need, but inquiring with them what they really need. Um, and I think it has been pivotal in some of the work we have done mm. um, yes. the past year. Yes. And, and of course you, 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 you spoke, uh, the example you gave, uh, uh, gave a really good example of uh, responding to complex situation. And uh, if VUCA was not known a few years ago now, almost everybody knows about it with the COVID crisis and the climate crisis uh, knocking on our door. Um, I don't know what weather it is in Totnes right now, uh, but here... Oh, in Totnes? Yeah. Yes. Here, yeah. Here, here we have 15 degrees and we should have uh, 30 degrees. Mm. Uh, so I think climate change is it's, it's, it's not on our doorstep, but we are right in it. Mm. Um, what do you think, how can whole intelligence and the five exploration um, support building a healthier society? Mm. Well, that's a big question. Um, I'm, I'm doing a lot uh, at the moment. I'm trying to turn a lot of my thinking into uh, audio presentations and things. And I've started a new channel on my website. Mm. Um, and that's really, that is the, almost the very first item that you've just asked me about is that's the first item. And I, what I'm talking about in it is that I think how it does uh, um, impact it's like everyone is involved in this. There is no way any of us can not respond to the global crisis. If we do nothing, if we pretend it's not happening, that is a response. Mm. So that's the first thing. These are kind of moral imperatives in a way. Mm. It's reality. You know, unless we're doing something in a sense to aid the problem, we are making the problem worse. So everybody has to take steps. And my step is a very painful one, but I'm trying to avoid or absolutely cut down to the minimum my air travel. Um, and I'm, you know, if I do go on an airplane now, it's like I, well, I've already started donating quite a lot of money each month to a forest which is planting lots of trees, but it's, you know, it's still terribly minor. But um, so that's, they all in a sense have, they also have implications so that if we move to um, interrelating, what the world needs more than anything else at this moment is collaboration. Mm. We have to find ways to break down mistrust um, and stereotypic projections and inequalities 
um, and you know us and them thinking all of those have to be challenged so there's a massive learning process in in creating the conditions whereby we can all work together and that all the countries of the world can work together and the scientific communities many of them need to be able to work together better and religions need to be able to talk to one another in ways which are uh, sensible to the greater whole and the needs of the greater whole mm. um, and um, uh, there needs to be I think part of the process that we all need is to recognize our humanity our hum uh, the fact that we are humanly have the same uh, or you know nearly identical physiology and that we and that what is what is necessary right across humanity is that we have the same life cycle people get older and they die it's quite foreground for me in a way um that uh the life cycle is a defining thing which every country every human group every tribe undergoes and there's a huge area that biologically we share and um, so that's the embodying the increase of understanding of embodying and then we definitely need to experiment a lot more we've got to do new things learn new ways to be we've got to be highly inventive and being prepared to bring real artistry and cleverness and originality of thought and 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 uh, and practice we have to invent whole new ways to have a, a human community on this planet which is sustainable mm. it's an incredible challenge but i don't think it's a challenge that we either we can dodge nor do we want to just disappear into a fog of despondency and depression we we've got to do our very very best mm. and for that finally we have to do quite a lot of looking at ourselves confronting the existential realities that we face mm. we are alive at an absolutely critical point in the history of the human race mm as a species we are really challenged and we have very little time mm. to make a change and it's an emergency it's a global emergency of the first order but the but in a sense that for that to be got over uh, and requires attending to which is a big if you like unfamiliar idea on a grand scale people want to deflect they want to desensitize they want to distract themselves drink or whatever they don't want to engage with the issue and that suddenly becomes the first order of challenge really is to raise awareness in other words for people to recognize the fact that they if they care about their children and their grandchildren mm. and the future at all that we need to make changes I'm, mm. i have three grandchildren and they matter to me among the hugely significant people in my life mm. what world are they we're giving them so it's like I, I i feel that the five expressions give a language they don't do much more than that in a way but they give a useful language for talking about these incredibly difficult problems at a global level and they also have applicability at a personal level and at mm. every level in between so it's like i do feel very excited in a way about the potentiality of them and that we need to have a we, they need to be in the public discourse. They mm. need to be part of how we think. Because at the moment, we don't have this language. 
they don't have this. And the Greeks had this term phronesis. I don't know whether you've ever heard that, but it was Socrates and Aristotle and Plato all wrote in different ways about phronesis, which was practical wisdom. Mm. Um, that's how it's usually translated. Mm. And they link it also, not only to capability, but also, also to virtue. Mm. We're talking about something very basic. That we some, somehow lost in the way. Mm. Absolutely being lost and we value you know we value people with high IQ well yeah okay but it's not sufficient mm. and the people who got all those clever banking types in the in the early years of this post millennium uh, who came up with more and more clever ways to to uh, get financial benefit for their banks and so on. Mm. Uh, very complicated things that often the, the uh, CEOs of the banks and things didn't understand themselves because it was just the whiz kid, bright young people coming up with these amazing algorithms and so on to, and uh, techniques and devices. But they had super IQ, but they were some of the dumbest actions that have ever been. Mm. And of course, with the COVID, we saw that traditional economics don't, doesn't work anymore. It's not about supply and demand. It's much more than that. Yeah. Mm. Yes, I mean, um, every country has been different about this, but there's a, a great deal of of um, defensiveness and secrecy and not really laying things out clearly in this country anyway and then and, and uh, a failure really to address the what is the gestalt mm. beginning the what is what is what's happening here mm. they didn't catch on quickly enough and they didn't act quickly enough and they didn't feel a sense of urgency and it's the same with the climate crisis there's not enough sense of urgency hmm. and we're at the end of, of the interview we, we we have one more question uh -huh. uh, and that i will pose in a moment yeah i will pose it in a moment because i was um as you, you were talking about VUCA times and what we're facing now and COVID-19 and what's needed and what's not, you mentioned something about uh, the stereotypes being more inclusive. And um, I guess I would like to invite you to conclude this interview for today uh, with a just a small reflection from your side, how can whole intelligence and the five exploration actually support us uh, into building more diverse, inclusive, and equal society, because um, I guess that's a challenge that we're all placed uh, into. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, I think that um, it, what we know is that uh, it really is the province first of all. I mean, all of the five are involved, but the one that's most obvious is interrelating. Because it's like the, the one of the fundamental characteristics that uh, seems to be evident and has been evident for countless generations is the is the creation of us and them. Like we create an us, we 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 put a as it were a a, a border around the group, our in-group, and we, we become an, a, a we and a, an us, and, it's, uh, and it's, it's lovely, you know, that's where we derive benefits and whatever. But the, it, the boundary that we put around us creates them. And the more that we have us and them thinking mm. as our standard operating procedure, the scope for stereotyping and 
um, advantage seeking and and uh, diminishing the others becomes it's so much easier so that in a sense the whole process of us and them thinking has to be challenged over and over and over mm. we, and the other emphasis and i think the emphasis as i said earlier about our biological heritage in our our, our bodies our lives our fragility you know the covid 19 has really shown across the world that we are all fundamentally equal equally fragile equally vulnerable um, and equally able to hopefully to accept that we are one species one species mm. one world community one set of planet dwellers mm. Mm. And if we could get that over, then I think that's a, a major step towards realizing that gross inequalities, violent uh, splits between people and so on, are all part of a kind of crazed uh, irrelevance, really, yeah. given the fact that we're all in the same situation, ultimately, of being earthlings mm. Mm. and earthlings under threat mm. so it's a if we're coming to the end it's a heavy note to end on but it's also uh we're 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 gifted in having a fantastic tradition behind us pushed out and and the and the discoveries that we've made in that and we have a i think an absolutely strong moral responsibility to apply those views and our understanding and bring them out into the world and i write somewhere in one chapter about being a citizen practitioner mm. and uh, i feel very strongly that that's what we all have to be mm. And of course, in your book, you're, uh, you bring a lot of cultures and their difference uh, on how they, uh, they and leave uh, the five explorations. Um, so uh, hmm. I encourage readers to, to, to read your, your book because I don't think we have time. But uh, for me, uh, this cooperation you talked about is really vital. Uh, to building a healthier mm. society of tomorrow. Absolutely. Mm, definitely. If we if we if we can't recognise the fact that we are one species, then we'll waste so much time and energy on competing and fighting and over the last resources and so on, which is a devastating. Will be a devastating way to for humanity to. Uh, kill itself off and wreck the biosphere. Mm. Mm. Not just us, but all the hordes of other organisms that exist on this planet, as well as us. Mm. Um, so. I, I, as always, it was a real pleasure and also uh, food for thought to talk to you, Malcolm. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Well, I've enjoyed it enormously, and it's, and of course, um, I mean, there's uh, another whole side to existence, which is to have, to enjoy oneself and to live every moment. Mm. And um, it's not all seriousness; it's not all gloom. And mm. I remember some times of sheer enjoyment in mm. both your companies and and uh, wish you very well and thank you very much for inviting me to do this it's been great enjoyed it a lot thank you thank you thank you for sharing all your knowledge and wisdom and bringing it a bit closer to all the people that are going to watch this video the concept of whole intelligence and maybe encouraging them to start exploring and who knows yeah good
good luck and good Thank luck you. with the rest of the interviews because it's good too. We need many different, need many different viewpoints, and this isn't mm -hmm. the only one that we're aware of. Them. Mm. Well, take care, Malcolm. Okay, and you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Both All the best. Bye bye. bye, -bye.